This is the new Plymouth Cricket. This Chrysler designed and built subcompact has been proven by several million miles of exhaustive road tests under a wide range of climatic conditions. But let's acquaint you with the vital statistics. Of the car, that is. Wheelbase is 98 inches, overall length 162, front and rear track 51 inches, and Cricket weighs in at just under a ton. The power plant is a four-cylinder overhead valve water-cooled engine. Displacement is a shade over 91 cubic inches. Horsepower is 70 at 5,200 RPM. The compression ratio is 8 to 1, and this little mill runs like a watch on regular grade gasoline. Now hold it. If George seems to be throwing information at you a bit fast, it's because we want to give you all the feature and service information we can and the time available. So hang on to your seats while George and I take turns discussing the anatomy, care, and feeding of a cricket. Very short push rods are made possible by the camshaft location high in the block. This design contributes to quiet valve train operation. The deep skirted block with its five main bearings is extremely rigid and the flat mating surface of pan and block provides a good oil seal. Valve faces and valve seats are both ground to a 45 degree angle. No interference or undergrind like our domestic engines. Exhaust and intake valve guides are reamed to the same diameter, but the exhaust valve stems are one thousandth smaller than intake to provide extra hot engine clearance. Incidentally, exhaust valve seat inserts are available for service. Adjust the valves in the firing order sequence engine not running, and you adjust them either completely cold or completely hot. It's very important to retorque the head bolts on the manifold after new engine run-in and then readjust valve tappets. The pistons are fitted with full floating piston pins. If you ever re-ring one of these engines, don't wipe the protective coating from the new service rings. This special coating is essential to correct break-in of the new rings. The oil pump is a lot like the one used on our 318 engine. Since the pump and distributor drive gear is on the pump shaft, you must re-time the pump gear any time you remove a pump or pull a camshaft. The engine lubrication system has a full flow oil filter. Engine oil and filter must be changed every 5,000 miles or every six months. On the subject of oil, it's normal for a new engine to use some oil until the full chrome rings are completely seated. So caution the owner to have the oil level checked every time he stops for gas. Now for the cooling system. The ball bearing water pump is serviced only as a complete assembly. Whenever you replace or reinstall a water pump, be sure and use the correct new gasket to ensure the right clearance between the pump impeller and the timing case. Another thing, if you drain the coolant, drain the block completely. If the block is partially drained so the pump seal is part wet and part dry, it will ruin the seal and cause it to leak. A two-stage thermostat is used. When the engine is cold, the upper valve closes off flow to the radiator and the lower valve is open, allowing circulation through the heater hoses. If the heater is turned off, flow is through the bypass between heater inlet and outlet hoses. When the engine warms up, the upper thermostat valve opens, allowing coolant to circulate through the radiator. The lower valve also remains open to provide coolant flow through the heater hoses. Under severely hot operating conditions, the upper valve opens all the way, and the lower valve shuts off flow to the heater. Full flow through the radiator core ensures maximum cooling when needed. Anything you want to add, George? Just one caution, Tech. If for any reason you don't have the correct replacement thermostat, don't use a substitute. It's better to run without than to use the wrong kind. The ignition distributor has automatic vacuum and centrifugal advance. When replacing ignition points, be sure and install the insulating washers correctly or you'll ground out the primary circuit. Point gap is 15 thousandths. Dwell is 60 to 63 degrees. The spark plug should be cleaned, center electrode dressed flat, and gap readjusted to 25 thousandths every 5,000 miles to ensure good engine performance. The charging system consists of a three-phase alternator having a built-in regulator. Six diodes are used to rectify the output current, 
and three additional diodes rectify a portion of the current so that it can be used for self-excitation of the field. And that brings us to the carburetor. The carburetor is called a constant depression type, but that doesn't mean it has anything to do with hard times. Here's what you'll find inside this little gem. A needle suspended in a fixed jet controls fuel flow requirements for all speeds from idle to full throttle. It works something like a metering rod. A piston-type air valve controls air flow, and the throttle valve controls mixture flow. As the throttle valve is opened, both the air valve and the fuel needle are pulled upward. This automatically lets more air and more fuel flow in the correct ratio for the amount of throttle opening. A detailed explanation of exactly how the carburetor works is a bit more than we can cover in this film. So read the details in the reference book and service manual. However, George will try and clear up some of the more obvious questions you probably have at this point. The air valve is attached to a diaphragm. The space above the diaphragm is called a depression chamber. Through a system of passages, the throttle valve controls the vacuum or low pressure applied to the upper side of the diaphragm and the air pressure applied to its underside. As a result, the diaphragm, air valve, and fuel needle are balanced or suspended between vacuum on the one side and air pressure on the other. The entire assembly sort of floats on air to maintain the correct air-fuel ratio. To prevent surging, a small piston operating in an oil-filled cylinder works something like a shock absorber or damper to ensure smooth operation of the air valve when the throttle is opened quickly. Enrichment for starting is provided by a disc valve. Metering holes of the valve control the flow of fuel from the float chamber to the mixing chamber. But that's all the time we have for engine, so let's tackle suspension highlights. The upper part of the front suspension consists of a coil spring and a strut assembly. The lower end of the strut is attached to the steering knuckle. A ball joint is used to attach the steering knuckle assembly to the lower control arm. With this suspension, there is no upper control arm, and there are no caster, camber, or steering axis adjustments. The only adjustment provided is for tow. This cutaway view of the strut assembly shows the built-in shock absorber. Service parts are available for rebuilding the shock absorber. However, if you rebuild one shock, you may have to refill the other with the same type and viscosity oil so that control will be the same on both sides of the car. The rack and pinion type steering gear provides excellent control and easy steering. There are only two adjustments, the rack damper shims and the pinion bearing preload shims. Toe is adjusted with the rack centered so that turning radius will be the same in both directions. The intermediate shaft is sharply angled so collision impact is not transmitted to the car interior. The rear suspension is the trailing link type. The upper links are angled so they function as stabilizer links. The lower links handle the drive and the braking forces. The shock absorbers are direct acting and sea leg mounted. Do not drive the car with the shock absorbers disconnected. If you hit a bump with a shock disconnected, the coil spring will pop out of its seat. The handbrake rod operates the automatic adjusters of the drum type rear brakes. Be sure the owner understands he must apply the handbrake periodically to maintain brake adjustment. At the front of the car, the disc brakes are the two-piston fixed caliper type. Before you tackle a job on these brakes, be sure and read the instructions in your service manual. The tandem master cylinder has a transparent reservoir, so you don't have to take anything off to check fluid level. As you probably know, vacuum-operated power brakes are standard. The fully synchronized four-speed manual transmission is also standard. The three-speed automatic transmission with console shift is optional. We've given you an imperial gallon of cricket highlights in a pint-sized package. So, re-thread the film and take a second silent look at all the features we've been talking about. Read all the labels and captions. Take your own sweet time in studying each picture and you'll find that you've learned a lot about cricket.
Versus Colt, the newest entry from the Dodge stable of dependable cars and trucks. Colt is every inch a thoroughbred, from its dual headlights to the tip of its tailpipe. But let's take a look at the official form sheet. The wheelbase is just a nose over 95 inches. Overall length is 161, give or take an inch or so for different body styles. And the front and rear tread is just over 50 inches. Colt is powered by an inline four-cylinder water-cooled engine having an overhead camshaft. Displacement is 97 and a half cubic inches. This little engine is a real high performance mill. Horsepower is 100 at 6,300 RPM, and torque is 101 at 4,000 RPM. <sighs> but I'm afraid I'll run out of breath if I try to keep this pace up. Tell you what, I'm going to let Bob here cover some of the more interesting engine highlights and a few facts about chassis features. I could talk about Dodge Colt all day, but since we only have about 10 minutes, I'll try and leave out all unnecessary adjectives and superlatives. The dual rocker arm shafts and overhead camshaft arrangement makes it possible to use a hemispherical combustion chamber. This is an ideal breathing arrangement with the exhaust valve shown at the left and the intake valve at the right. As you probably know, this cross-flow valve arrangement promotes excellent scavenging of the exhaust gases from the combustion chamber. And though it's not shown in this view, the incoming air-fuel mixture provides good spark plug cooling. The cylinder head is an aluminum alloy casting, having the hemispherical combustion chambers which are precision machined to ensure uniform volume and shape. And that suggests an important service precaution. Let the engine cool down completely before you remove the cylinder head. As an added precaution, be sure and follow the correct head bolt removal sequence to avoid head warpage. Incidentally, the head bolt tightening sequence is in the reverse order and equally important. So check your service manual for details. If the cylinder head has been removed or serviced, the valve lash must be temporarily adjusted to seven thousandths for exhaust and three thousandths for intake to establish cold running clearance. After the engine is warmed up, they must be readjusted to ten thousandths and six thousandths. Valves cannot be adjusted with engine running. Both the valve seats and valve guides are the replaceable type. Be sure and dig into that service manual before you tackle a major head and valve reconditioning job. The cam ground tapered skirt aluminum alloy pistons are fitted with three fine grain cast iron rings. The top compression ring and the oil ring are hard chrome plated to ensure good ring and cylinder wall life. The cold forged steel piston pins are a press fit in the connecting rod and full floating in the piston. Since the piston pins are offset 40 thousandths to prevent piston slap, be sure and install them correctly. The cast iron cylinder block is the rigid deep skirt type. The forged steel crankshaft is carried on five precision type main bearings. Now suppose you cover lubrication, Bob. The oil should be changed at the 600 mile inspection at every three months or 4,000 miles thereafter. The full flow filter should be changed at 4,000 miles and then every other oil change. It's normal for a new engine to use some oil until the chrome plated rings are fully seated. So caution the owner to have the oil level checked every time he stops for gas. That's a good point, Tech. The owner should also know that the cooling system has a 14 pound pressure cap with a pressure release button. When the engine is hot, it's very important to release the system pressure before removing the cap to check the coolant level. It's very important to use a high quality antifreeze both winter and summer. A 50% solution of Chrysler antifreeze will provide year round protection against corrosion. This is particularly important because of the aluminum cylinder head. The ignition system is the conventional coil and distributor type. The distributor provides automatic centrifugal and vacuum advance. Ignition point gap is 18 to 22 thousandths and spark plug gap is 28 to 32 thousandths. The charging system is an alternator with built-in silicon diode rectifiers. The regulator is a voltage limiting relay and a pilot light relay. The pilot light relay makes it possible to use a charging system warning light instead of an ammeter. How about taking overtake? Gladly, Bob. 
Colt has a heated air or temperature controlled air intake system, very much like the one used on our other cars. Incidentally, that canister and purge valve on the firewall is part of the vapor saver system. Both of these features are part of the cleaner air system. The compound two-barrel downdraft carburetor will probably be completely new to most of you. We can't hope to explain all of the systems, but Bob will give you a quick rundown on the highlight features. For all practical purposes, this is half of a four-barrel carburetor. The secondary Venturi doesn't get into the act until the driver calls for more power than the primary can supply. The primary barrel, or Venturi, handles starting, idle, and all moderate load operation. But let's take a closer look. The primary side of the carburetor has a main discharge nozzle, an adjustable bypass screw to control off-idle mixture, and a pilot or idle mixture screw. This side of the carburetor supplies the correct air-fuel mixture for all requirements up to medium engine load operating conditions. The choke valve is also located in the primary side. Choke operation is controlled by an integral automatic choke assembly. That short water hose connected to the choke delivers engine coolant to the choke so that its operation is very closely matched to engine temperature. The automatic choke assembly also contains the fast idle cam mechanism and a vacuum kick device that partially opens the choke valve as soon as the engine starts. The secondary side of the carburetor also has a main discharge nozzle. As the load on the engine increases, the vacuum-controlled secondary throttle valve opens to supplement the output of the main nozzle in the primary side of the carburetor. From medium to full load, both barrels are in operation to supply engine air-fuel mixture requirements. That's the diaphragm-type accelerator pump at the left. That little solenoid to the right cuts off fuel when the ignition is turned off. This permits a relatively high idle speed for emission control and prevents after-run. The throttle positioner solenoid is just above it. That's little more than a sociable introduction to the carburetor and the cleaner air system. However, it should give you some idea what it's all about and convince you that you really should get out your trusty service manual before you start tinkering with a carburetor. The front suspension is the strut type with coiled springs. The strut serves as the steering axis. It is also a double acting shock absorber. The upper end of the strut is mounted in a self-lubricated ball bearing. and The lower part of the strut is attached directly to the steering knuckle. A ball joint connects the knuckle and strut assembly to the outer end of the control arm. Caster, camber, and steering axis inclination are preset by the mounting at the upper end of the strut assembly and the ball joint at the lower end. Therefore, with the exception of toe, front end geometry is not adjustable. The steering linkage is quite similar to the symmetrical type used on our other cars. There are two short adjustable tie rods, an idler arm, and a center link. The steering gear is a variable ratio, recirculating ball type. The lowest ratio and highest effort is in the straight-ahead position for good directional stability. The ratio increases and the effort decreases as the wheel is turned to provide easier steering. A collapsible impact-absorbing steering assembly is used, and the adjustable tilt-type steering column is standard equipment. The rear suspension has leaf springs and sea leg mounted double-acting shock absorbers. Incidentally, the rear axle and differential setup is pretty much the same as the eight and one quarter inch axle used on some of our other cars. The rear brakes are drum type with manual adjusters. Be sure the owner understands that periodic rear brake adjustment will be required. Disc brakes at the front of the car are standard equipment. These are the fixed caliper type, having two opposing pistons and shoes. The tandem master cylinder has separate brake fluid reservoirs. Unlike our other cars, the front reservoir is for the front brakes and the rear reservoir for the rear brakes. Fluid level can be seen through the translucent reservoirs. A fully synchronized four-speed transmission is standard and the three-speed automatic is optional. For the rest of the powertrain... I'm sorry, Bob, but we've run out of time again. Since this session on Dodge Colt moved pretty fast, I'd suggest that you re-thread the film and take a second look at the pictures. And remember, 
Before you put a metric wrench on this little car, get out your Colt service manual and make sure you know what you're doing. It's up to you master technicians to take care of the grooming of this newest Dodge Thoroughbred.